All right, in this video, we're going to continue doing a ton of series multiple choice questions to prepare for the BC calculus exam. Calculus exam. <laughs> this is part five. The other parts exist, and you can go find them. All right, let's get started. Which of the following series are conditionally convergent? All right, we've been asked about this a lot. That means that it converges when it alternates. It does not converge when you look at the absolute value of the terms. Um, so, conditionally convergent. Uh, number one is definitely convergent if I take the absolute value of the terms, uh, although, I don't know, maybe you're not uh, sure of that. So what I would do is I would just use the ratio test, I guess, on this. The ratio test kills absolute values, so it's the n plus first term times the reciprocal of the nth term, or divided by the nth term. Um, and then if we do this, we just get 1 over n plus 1, which is 0, uh, as you go to infinity, so that's less than 1. So this converges um, absolutely, and so it does not converge conditionally. Um, and that's the relevant thing. So the other two I'm pretty confident of. So uh, for part 2, if I take the absolute value, I just get uh, 1 over, um, I get 1 over n to the 1 half. And that means that p is 1 half, which is less than 1, so diverges. So diverges when I take the absolute value, but that's definitely a convergent alternating series. So that's a yes. And then uh, the third one, if I take the absolute value, I get uh, 1 over n plus 1, um, which diverges. And this is definitely a convergent alternating series, so... Yes. All right. So two and three are convergent when they alternate. They are not convergent when I take the absolute value. So they are conditionally convergent. And then option one was absolutely convergent. So two and three is our answer. Let's look at the next one. Which of the following statements about the series? Negative one to the n um, times n over n squared plus one is true. Okay. Uh, I don't know. We got to read them. The series can be shown to diverge by comparison. So if I'm going to do like straight uh, comparison, I need a positive term series. So that can't be it. Uh, can be shown to diverge by limit comparison. Again, I would need a positive term series for that. Um, so that's, that's out. Can be shown to converge by comparison. Again, if I'm comparing, I need a positive term series. Unless I'm doing like absolutely convergent, but this is not an absolutely convergent thing. So... Uh, I'm going to say the answer uh, can be shown to converge by the alternating series test, which is definitely true. Um, and these first three just require positive term series. So I'm not sure what the intention was here or if that's how you were meant to deal with it. I don't know. But this thing does not converge absolutely. So I wouldn't really be able to show any of these things anyway. Um, and then what I'm doing for the alternating series test uh, or rather, this is the reason that it doesn't converge absolutely. It's basically 1 over n when you take the absolute value. Um, and then the alternating series test, I would say that the terms alternate, they decrease in mag excuse me, they decrease in magnitude, and then the limit is zero. So converges by alternating series test. Next up, which of the following series converge? So we just have to decide if they converge. My initial thought, one converges because of the factorial in the denominator, two is geometric and will converge. And then three, I think the n term test will tell us diverges. So that's my that's my gut feeling, and that's how you want to like handle these. Now I'm going to go through and do the work. Um, so for option one, I'm going to use the ratio test because of the factorial. So this would be my work. Again, I'm not like making you watch me write in these because you can always pause and rewind and slow down, whatever. Um, but that would be my ratio test. I get that the limit ultimately is zero, which is less than one, so convergent. Um, for two, it's just geometric, but I like to rewrite my geometric series. We could find the sum of this, but it's not relevant. We just need to know if it converges or diverges. One over E is less than one, so this converges. And then for three, I would use the nth term test for divergence. Um, and so that requires L'Hopital's rule a couple of times, or you just look at it and you're like, exponentials grow faster than polynomials, so this will go to infinity. But our final answer is that one and two converge, and three diverges, so the answer is C. All right, let X be a real number. Which of the following statements about the series? Um, the sum from K equals one to infinity of E to the KX is true. Okay, so, there's like the E, the K, and the X, I think could potentially screw you up. This is just geometric. 
but it's geometric where there's also an X in the problem. Um, so I'm gonna rewrite this as e to the kx um, is e to the x to the k. And now I think it looks a little more overtly geometric, right? We have a common ratio of e to the x. R is equal to e to the x. So the sum of this is the first term, we take k equals one and plug it in, we get e to the x. So e to the x over one minus the ratio is e to the x. This will converge provided that the absolute value of e to the x is less than one. So now I gotta work that out. So at this point, the answer is either C or D. Um, and keep in mind that lower bound, right? The lower bound there was K equals one. If K had equaled zero, the answer would have been either A or B because the first term would have just been one. You have to watch out for that, which is why I always think of it as the first term over one minus the ratio, not like A sub zero. Like it's just easier if you think first term, like what's the first term of the series? Take that bottom number and plug it in. All right, so I'm gonna do this graphically to figure out where e to the x is less than one. A graph of e to the x will look like this. It has a y-intercept of one. So e to the x is less than one when I'm to the left of zero. So when x is less than zero, so my answer is c. All right, new problem. Uh, if b and t are real numbers such that uh, zero is less than zero, T is less than B and they're both positive. Their absolute values are positive. They're not necessarily positive numbers. Um, which of the following uh, infinite series has sum one over B squared plus T squared? I just think this question couldn't be more annoying uh, is my opinion of it. Cause I like, there's no way to do it other than to like do them, I think. And I don't want to do that. But you will notice that most of them have like the same basic form. They're like the quantity T squared over B squared to the K. Or if they alternate, they're the quantity negative t squared over b squared to the k. So like it's a lot of work, but not as much as maybe you think. Like I'm gonna do a and see if it's the answer. So uh, initially we just know that you know the absolute value of t over b is gonna be less than one. So it's gonna be convergent, but that's not really relevant because like they have to have a sum. Um, so this one I do one over b squared. Uh, the first term is one over one minus t squared over b squared. And then this is gonna clean up to this, which gives us a sum of one over b squared minus t squared. Now the most relevant thing here is that when we had t squared over b squared, we ended up with b squared minus t squared in the denominator, which means to me that like, if a isn't the answer, then c also could not be the answer. Um, so now I'm gonna look at B, and if B is not the answer, then I'm just gonna choose D. That's, that's my strategy. So here I'm doing the same thing. Uh, I'm gonna rewrite it though. Negative one to the K and T squared over B squared to the K, bring them all under one parenthesis so you can figure out that R is negative T squared over B squared. That's what I do with geometric all the time. I try to rewrite them so that R is, is its own self-contained set of parentheses. So now we're gonna do the same thing. So it's one over B squared, the first term is one, over one minus the ratio. So one minus negative t squared over b squared. This will clean up to this. And this actually is one over b squared plus t squared, which is the answer. But again, to reiterate, if that had not been the answer, I would have just chosen d and not done the work because of the difference in the denominators that we were getting. Um, so my answer here is b. I hate this problem because it feels like you just have to do a lot of geometric sums, which isn't the worst thing in the world, but like, I don't know, why, why are we doing that? All right, the sum from one to infinity of e to the n over pi to the n is, so I mentioned before, they like to compare e and pi. e is less than pi, so this is geometric, r is e over pi, we're good to go. I'm gonna rewrite it because that's what I like to do. So it's from one to infinity of e over pi to the n, gonna be the first term. So when you plug in that bottom number, you get e over pi, over one minus e over pi. And now it's like an annoying algebra problem. So we get this, we get this, we get this. Um, so e over pi minus e is our answer, which is b. And let's take a look at the next question. All right, if x and y are positive real numbers, that's, uh, that's good, right? Because if they're not positive, then you gotta consider like a million cases. Um, not a million, but more than one. Uh, which of the following conditions guarantee that the infinite series, the sum from zero to infinity of 
x over y times the quantity x over y squared to the n converges. All right, so this is geometric. It's just weirdly geometric, right? We have a thing to the n, and then the initial term is just x over y. So we could actually find the sum if we needed to, but we just need to know like what condition will force it to have a sum. So it is geometric, and the thing being raised to the nth power is x over y squared. So we need the absolute value of x over y squared to be less than 1. This is where it would be kind of annoying, I think, if they weren't positive. Well, not really, because y squared is always positive, so like wouldn't really impact much. But um, we do know that there are positive numbers, so we can drop the absolute value and just say x over y squared is less than 1, which means that x will be less than y squared. And if x is less than y squared, then uh, there you go. That's our answer. So it's like a little weird, but not terrible. All right, next question. The integral test can be used to conclude which of the following statements about the infinite series from 2 to infinity, 1 over n, natural log of n, is true. You might recall, wait, well, I mean, if you're watching all the videos, if you're not watching all the videos, you won't recall anything. But if you've watched all the videos to this point, good for you. Um, and also... We ran into this series and I had accidentally typed that it started at one and then I was like, I think that's a typo. And here it is again. So this is a classic integral test uh, problem, even if you weren't told, because you look at that and you're like, I think I could integrate that thing. That's, that's the rule that I use for when I might try the integral test. I look at the series and think, if that was a function, I could integrate it. And if the answer to that question is yes, I go for the integral test. Um, assuming no other test like obviously works because I'd rather use almost any other test anytime. Um, all right, so the options are the series converges and the terms of the series have limit zero. Uh, so this terms of the series have limit zero could be useful um, because like if you just take the limit as an approach to infinity of one over n natural log of n, you definitely get zero. So they have a limit of zero. So uh, some of these options are do not have a limit of zero, we can basically eliminate C and D right now because, you know, whatever. Let's use the integral test. All right, so the answer is going to be diverges and it's going to have a limit of zero, but here goes. Um, F of X is one over X natural log of X. So I knew it diverged by the way, and I mentioned this the last time it came up. You just want to know for certain series this is a series that comes up often enough. It's not like a super famous series. Uh, I don't know if it has an application or some reason that it comes up other than you can integrate it and there aren't that many good integral test problems. Um, you do just want to know them, right? And if you do enough practice problems, eventually you're like, oh, this guy again. Um, and that's what happened to me here. Like I know this diverges and I know that it has a limit of zero. Um, so my function is one over X natural log of X. All right, this is positive. This is continuous for x greater than or equal to 2 and decreasing for x greater than or equal to 2. I am a fan of just asserting that that is true. I don't prove it. I just say that it is. I can think of some free response questions where like part A of the question is like find where this function is decreasing and then part B is like use the integral test and then you can like reference your answer from part A and be like we know that it's decreasing blah blah blah. Um, but if if they don't make me do that I just claim that it is and hope that that's enough, and it usually is. Um, so now, the integral test. We want to do 2 to infinity of f of x, which is the limit as b approaches infinity of 2 to b of f of x dx. That's an essential step on a free response question. Get the notation right so that you don't lose points for notation. Losing points for notation are the saddest points you can lose because everybody can get notation right. Whether you can, you know, go on to solve the problem or not, you know, a little dicier. Uh, for this particular function, I'm doing u substitution where u is natural log of x, but I end up with the natural log of technically the absolute value of the natural log of x, but because we're going from 2 to infinity, everything is positive, so I've dropped the absolute value. And then this notationally becomes this, which is basically infinity because the natural log of the natural log of infinity is infinity. Um, and then, you know, minus a number. And then, um, so the integral diverges and that means that the series diverges and so our answer is b which i chose like three minutes ago all right so if i didn't have to do the work on that on a multiple choice i wouldn't have done the work i would have just picked b and moved on a long long time ago but let's take a look at the next one. Oh, and also i should say the limited zero it, free response i would show that work but whatever here we go consider the infinite series one over n squared 
which is like a convergent p-series, so I don't know why I would use the integral test, but the integral test can be used to verify convergence of the series because this function is positive, continuous, and decreasing for x greater than or equal to one. All right, which of the following inequalities is true? This is something that I do not emphasize in my classes because I don't really think this would be on the AP exam anymore. I don't think it's even in the course description, but we can work it out. Um, so let's do that. So uh, I'm gonna start off with a picture of one over x squared, basically, one over n squared, if you wanna call it that. All right, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do a right Riemann sum from one to infinity. A right Riemann sum will give me these inscribed rectangles. Okay, now these, if I add up all of these rectangles, they will definitely be less than the integral from one to infinity of f of x dx. They have to be because they're inscribed, right? A decreasing function, a right Riemann sum is going to underestimate it. So I know that that's true. Now, the problem with this is that it's not really the series because this would be like one over two squared, one over three squared, one over four squared. This is almost the series, but we're missing the first term of the series. We're missing like this rectangle, which would give me one over one squared. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add one to both sides of this inequality and say that one plus the sum of the rectangles is going to be less than one plus the integral from one to infinity. And that's good because one plus the sum of the rectangles is the series. So I now know that the series from one to infinity of one over n squared is less than one plus one to infinity of f of x dx, which means looking at the answer choices, it's either b or c. And I just need to work out like, I mean, at this point, if you're stuck for time, just flip a coin. Um, but we can actually still work this out. And I'm gonna use the exact same idea, kind of. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna graph again, but I'm gonna use a left Riemann sum from one to infinity. So here would be my left Riemann, I'm sorry, from two to infinity, because uh, for whatever reason, we're using two. So if I do two to infinity, uh, a left Riemann sum, those are definitely bigger, right? The sum of these rectangles is bigger than the definite integral because it's a left Riemann sum on a decreasing function. So the sum of these rectangles is definitely already bigger than the integral from two to infinity. So since it's bigger, I can just add one to the left side of this and it will be even bigger. So if I just do this and I do one plus the sum of those rectangles is bigger. Now here's the thing. I did look at the rectangles I've drawn. They're the same rectangles, right? In both cases, I have one plus the sum of my rectangles. And in both cases, one plus the sum of those rectangles is the series. So the series itself is in between two to infinity and one plus one to infinity, which means that the answer is B. It's a very satisfying problem to work out. I don't know, on the AP exam, would I work it out? Probably, because I think I would fly through a lot of it and have time at the end to go back. If I didn't have time, I might've just gotten uh, the first result and been like, all right, kind of a coin flip. Uh, also, I do think, although this is not like the best strategy in the world, it seems weird to me that like C and D are even options where you just have like these two, like why would the sum not be in between the integrals? It just like feels right for the sum to be in between the integrals from a test taking standpoint. I think I would have eliminated C and D right away. And then as soon as I did B, you know, got my first thing, I would have known the answer was B. I don't know. Um, but anyway, you can like draw some nice pictures and really work this out. I don't think that this would be on the exam anymore but I'm sure that at some point it will be exactly on the exam and everyone will leave comments about how I said it wouldn't be. Anyway, this is part whatever. I don't even remember what part we're on. I'm done with it. The previous parts uh, exist. The future parts probably also exist. They're probably in a playlist. I hope you found this helpful and good luck.